Good morning, everyone. Welcome, one and all, to this time of worship. As we gather in this place, it is our joy to welcome you, and we pray that as we gather in this time, as we gather in this attitude of praise and worship, that you would be keenly aware of the presence of God among our gathering and with you in your own lives. Uh, Friends, as we gather a few announcements, as always, uh, should there be any reason to leave the sanctuary during our time of worship, exits are available to your rear and down front to your left, and on such an occasion, an usher or other volunteer will be available to help guide you in the right direction. We have several things coming up in this week ahead. They're listed in your bulletin as well, but I would highlight a few of them. Wellspring for Women will hold its next meeting on Tuesday morning at 9.30 a.m. in the Lower Fellowship Hall. And then next Sunday following worship, both the Mission Committee and the Nominating Committee will be having their next meetings. Uh, We are moving into the nominating season, so nominating will be seeking um, suggestions for possible candidates for officers. So if you or someone you know, someone you think might be a good candidate for either being an elder on session or a deacon or a trustee, uh, there will be a time and place for you to submit those names to the nominating committee for consideration. Next Monday, October 14th, Women in Wisdom will have its next monthly meeting at 6.30 p.m. in the Narthex. And then on Sunday, October 20th, we're having our next fellowship gathering and first real potluck of the season. It will be our fall gathering potluck. Uh, I know that October 20th is a home Bills game, which means that some of our congregation may be going to that. But for the rest of us, you are invited to join us in Upper Fellowship Hall for a potluck based around our favorite tailgating dishes to eat during the game. And uh, we are doing everything in our power to make sure that the game is available to be watched while we enjoy one another's company and enjoy some good dishes to share. Uh, There's more information on that and many other things on the kiosk in the narthex. So if you would be so kind during our fellowship time, take a look at that kiosk, see what's there, and sign up in the appropriate places. I would also call your attention, many of you noticed in the narthex prior to worship, there's a board listing thank you notes from all the various mission organizations and opportunities which Clarence Presbyterian has supported uh, financially and in other ways over the course of the past year. The mission committee wants you to be able to see where our uh, our support and our funding is going. So this is a, a representation of some of the mission we support through our budget and through your offerings. So take a note of some of those and recognize the ways in which we are supporting and connecting with organizations around our region and even around our country. Friends, in this time and place now, let us gather ourselves for worship and let us quiet our minds and our spirits in the presence of God. To my sisters and brothers, I will tell your glory. Lord our God, how majestic is your name. In the great congregation, I will sing your praise. O Lord our God, how majestic is your name. Let us respond in faith by singing together hymn number 504 in our purple Glory to God hymnals.
Faithful God, we give you thanks that nothing can separate us from your love. Receive us again as beloved children so that we may enter your presence this day and abide with you forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We are reminded as we gather and worship that in God we find light for our darkness, and through that light we discover the things which separate us from God. And so we ask God to prove us and try us, to test our hearts and minds that we may receive forgiveness through the grace offered through Christ our Lord. In faith of this promise, let us pray together. Loving God, you created us to live in relationship with you, to love and serve one another, and to care for all your creatures. Yet in the hardness of our hearts, we dismiss your commandments and seek to go our separate ways. Lord, have mercy on us. Redeem, restore, and recreate us for the sake of Christ our Savior. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, and the faithfulness of God is steadfast and true. In the love of Christ, know that we are forgiven, healed, and made whole, and in this knowledge may we be at peace. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us also forgive and greet one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Peace be with all of you. At this time, I'd like to invite kids and young at heart down for time of junior sermon. today. Are you ready to go outside and enjoy the nice weather? Are you ready to root for a team today? No? Well, we'll get there. I wanted to ask you something, and I'm going to, my back's hurting, so I'm going to come down this way. Now, this is kind of a big question, so if you need to think about it, that's okay, and if you're not sure how to answer, that's okay. But it's a question that I'm curious to hear from you if you're willing or if you have an idea. 
What's the most important thing about church? What do you think? Learning about Jesus and God. That's certainly very important. Anyone else have any other ideas that they think are important? Yeah, Madison. To learn about God and praise God together. Yeah, that's very important. Mm hmm. Anything else? Yeah, Andrew. Being with everyone together in this place? Yeah. These are all completely right and perfect answers. I'm curious to ask because sometimes I think that I need to know everything, and that feels like a lot. Do any of you ever feel like you have to know everything? Like maybe at school your teachers just ask you things over and over and over again, and then you have to do homework. And Parents and adults, I want you to note that they are all nodding vigorously with what I am saying. <laughs> that sometimes it feels like a lot to try to feel like you have to know everything. Well, I have good news for you, and it's good news for me, and it's good news for all of you as well. You ready? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? You don't have to know everything all the time. Okay? Can we all get that? You don't need to know everything all the time. You don't need to know everything all the time. Now, we try. We want to keep, don't touch the bells. We want to keep learning. We want to keep growing and developing and doing better and better and better. We want to keep knowing God and Jesus more and more. But we're doing all that together. We're helping one another out. None of us has to have all of the answers because all of us together have the answers that we need. And we're here for one another. And that's the way that it should be. And that's pretty good news, I think, especially on a day when we recognize that we come together as a team and we celebrate those that work together. So let's make our freeform shape and let's give thanks. And then let's go keep learning about God and Jesus and the church and everything else. Let's make some room so that everyone can get in. Just watch the bells behind you. All right. Can you guys pray with me? Dear God, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you for bringing us together with one another. Bless our time together and our lives in you. Amen. All right, everyone. Go enjoy Sunday school and junior church.
bow your heads for the prayer of illumination. Lord God, as you spoke long ago through the voices of your prophets, speak to us here, speak to us now, through this power of your spirit and the promise of your Son. Christ our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament reading for today is Job chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 429. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him, to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, Skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The psalm for today is Psalm 26, verses 1 through 12, and it can be found on your pew Bible on page 476. We will read it responsibly. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I hate the company of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. Do not sweep me away with the sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty. But as for me, I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. seated. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. It may be found in your pew Bibles on page 43 if you wish to read along, but let us listen for God's word to us today. Some, testing Jesus, asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. 
Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Friends, these are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Holy One, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. It is entirely possible to take the calling to discipleship and faithful living too seriously. I've mentioned before that I grew up going to Camp Duffield in the summers. Pretty much for as long as I can remember, Duffield has been a part of my life and while the first couple of occasions carried the challenge of leaving home for sleepaway camp, after that it was nothing but joy. Every summer brought the promise of fun and deep-seated joy experienced at camp with the people I liked most in the world. As I graduated high school, that joy continued and increased as I became a counselor not only working at Camp Duffield, but working with the people I had gone to camp with each summer, people who were as close as siblings to me. It was wonderfully an amazing experience. And as that <clears throat> first summer as a counselor came to an end, some of our conversation turned to whether or not we would consider coming back the next summer to do it all again. I gave the only answer that made sense in my brain, that I would absolutely come back for another season. Which apparently surprised one of my friends, whom I had known since I was three years old and whom I had worked alongside every day of the past eight weeks. With a look of incredulity, he simply exclaimed, Really? Yes, I assured him, I would be happy to come back. Personally, I was surprised that his incredulity would be his reaction. So I asked him about it, and his response struck me as much as an unexpected tidal wave. It's just, it seems like you don't like kids. Now, I don't dislike kids. Not now, and certainly not then. But his response released one of those hindsight, oh, I see now, moments in my brain that had been hidden from my awareness. Because I realized that I had just spent an entire summer in a place that I loved, taking everything too seriously. I had become focused on the policy and the procedure, on making sure all the rules were followed all the time. No exceptions. I was so determined to be a model counselor that I forgot, or rather perhaps ignored, the very spirit of the place that I was in and everything that it meant, all that it stood for. And that attitude showed in how I went about my days, how I interacted with my fellow staff and campers. And it gave the impression that I disliked camp, that I didn't like kids. <clears throat> I had become so focused and intent, and intent on doing what I thought was right that I actually missed the mark in doing things in the most faithful way, in the way that I had been called. I'd like to think that I'm not the only one who has ever done that. That maybe some of us here have been in a similar position, so focused on living into who we think we're supposed to be as parents, 
as siblings, as members of the workforce or leaders in our area or industry, that we forget the human interaction piece of this calling we've received, that we forget love, and we ignore the spirit in which we are called. I'd like to think I'm not the only one here who has ever done that. Certainly, the disciples have. We are still dwelling with the disciples in their moment of realizing what they've been doing and taking the opportunity to shift their approach, to return to a greater faithfulness. These past readings have been difficult to face in no small measure because they can reflect our own very human lives and perspectives. But the good news of the gospel is that the opportunity to repent and return to a more faithful response is ever present and available. The disciples have been in a rather serious headspace. And given the nature of the news Jesus had shared with them, which turned their world, their understandings and expectations on their heads, it can be understood. But Jesus, knowing that they're stuck in that space, is not going to leave them there. He keeps bringing children into the picture and lifting them as an example. And I believe that serves multiple purposes. Recently, the children helped to remind the disciples, and us as well, that to receive the kingdom of God requires an ability to trust and learn from the very one who is able to show us the way. In order to receive the calling that is before us, we must also embrace the reality that we need to be guided, that support and help is offered. And in a similar vein today, we recognize again that to live as disciples, to live into the calling we have received, brings with it joy and celebration, exuberance in life and ministry. Brothers and sisters in faith, God has given us the fullness of life and resurrection, and the joy that comes with that is beyond measure or containment. How wonderful a gift this is. And we frequently take our faith so seriously that we forget to live into being a people of joy. True, deep-seated joy, which is always there, ready for us to recognize it and allow it to shine forth through us. The disciples certainly needed that reminder. There is a direct tie-in to Jesus earlier in the story, admonishing them to let the children come to me, and the story now as parents begin to do just that, bring their children to Jesus to be embraced. Jesus, in response to the disciples' misguided attempt at keeping the children away, embraced the child instead a sign of full welcome and acceptance and joy at the opportunity. That embrace is continuing through this encounter, full of welcome, full of joy, and in this is our own integrity and faith. We have one of the greatest gifts ever shared with the world, And with it comes the joy of living and engaging in ministry together in the Spirit of God. Not our gift alone, but a gift of joy to the world, a gift we can fully celebrate. And we live in faithful integrity when we get out of our own way and let this joy infuse every aspect of living, every aspect of our ministry, every aspect of our fellowship and discipleship honest, faithful integrity. Throughout the coming weeks, we will be journeying in the story of Job. Job, who we will see is caught in the middle of a spiritual tug of war between God and the accuser, trying to see if they can get Job to give up and curse God's name. And as we will see in this journey, Job goes through lot. But the bar he sets at the outset 
is held throughout. He will not curse God's name. And this is accounted to him as faithfulness and integrity. Job remembers and celebrates the fullness of God, even when he cannot celebrate anything else in his life. And if Job can demonstrate such commitment, then so can we. It will not be easy. Some days will be far more difficult than others. And true joy does not demand that we be falsely happy with a smile painted on our face, but joy does carry the day. It is entirely possible to take the calling to discipleship and faithful living too seriously. We are called to an integrity of faith, and to live into this integrity is to be joyful in our faith, a joy that is lived out in the ways we embrace and welcome our youth, and in how we welcome one another. And this can only be achieved through honesty, with ourselves, with one another, and with God. Job was honest, even in his faithfulness, as we begin to see today and will see in the weeks to come. He is honest in his dislike of the situation, but also in his faithfulness toward God and who God is. Anyone who has worked with children or youth knows how crucial it is to be honest. Our youngest members can tell, innately it seems, when we are being dishonest with ourselves or with others, and especially with them. In the coming months, we will be exploring how we, as a congregation in this particular time and place, commit and work toward enhancing our vitality. We will look at our ministries, our missions, our fellowship as a church, and a communion of faith, but all of this is for naught if we forget the joy that has been placed before us in all peoples of God. We even celebrate today World Communion Sunday, that day on which Christian churches not only around the country but around the world come to the Lord's table, east and west and north and south, joining together in this meal. What joy to know that we share this table together again in the Spirit of our Lord. The joy of the Lord is and ever will be before us. The joy of faithful discipleship and living has been given to us. How we embody that is as numerous as the stars in the heavens, but the joy, the light of living, is present in each and every case. Brothers and sisters, may we be overcome by this joy and live with such faithful integrity. Amen. Let us respond by joining together in joyful hymn, singing hymn number 197.
Please be seated. In the joy that we are given, in the joy of coming again to this table, we are invited to return as well to our Lord in prayer. On behalf of our own community, our family and friends, near and far, our members of this congregation, on behalf of our area and our country, on behalf of our world and all who are in need, wherever they may be and whatever they may face. And so, with faithful, joyful hearts, let us lift our spirits together in prayer. Gracious and merciful Lord, we are grateful for the joy that is set before us and the promise that in faith you are ever ready to hear our prayers, to attend your spirit to our spirits, and join us as we seek the welfare of this country, this world, and all who are under your care. This morning, O oh Lord, we pray especially for those who grieve and mourn, who feel cut off from loved ones and isolated, who are unsure of the state of their loved ones, especially in the areas of western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee and the other areas that have experienced the devastation of Hurricane Helene. We pray for those who are injured and ill, who yearn for wholeness and healing, who long to live into the spirit that dwells within them, but whose bodies are unable to rise to the task. We pray for those who are confused and uncertain, who seek a direction and a path to follow, certain that there is one, but perhaps unable to discern which way to go. And we pray for all who struggle in this world, those who struggle against the violence visited upon them by addictions and uncertainties, as well as those who struggle against the violence imposed by others who seem to want or demand more than is necessary. Lord, we pray for your world. We pray for your people. We pray for those who are known to us, and we lift to you those who are unknown to us but are certainly known to you. With our hearts full of all of these, we pray, and we join our voices together with the voices of all who have been taught to pray in your name, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, out of the gifts that we have received, let us offer our gifts for the ministries of this congregation and the faithful proclamation of the kingdom of God far and wide.
Gracious Lord, for these gifts and for all good gifts which we have received in your name, we offer our thanks, and we pray that the gifts we humbly offer now would be faithfully used in the name of this congregation and in the name of your kingdom to proclaim hope and goodness throughout this region, throughout this country, throughout this world. Bless the gift and the giver in your name, we pray, O Lord, now and always. Amen. Please be seated. As we prepare to come to this table, I would advise you uh, on something that you may have already noticed. We're doing things a little bit differently today. Brace yourselves. It's okay. Uh, the communion liturgy should be found on an insert in your bulletins, front and back. Uh, during this liturgy, there is a sung call and response in a few different places. I've included the music, should you want it, but the easy thing is that I will sing a phrase and then you just repeat back what you hear. And the choir is already rehearsed and ready to go along, so even if you just mouth the words, it will be okay. But I encourage you, let us embrace, uh, enjoy coming to the table that is set before us. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to praise you, O God, creator of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and serve you and to live in peace with your creation. When we rebelled against you, you did not abandon us, but sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we join our voices with the choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever praise your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, welcomed sinners, and proclaimed good news to the poor. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. As we come to this table, brothers and sisters in faith, we remember that our Lord gathered around table with his disciples and friends, and that during the meal he took the bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Then, in the same way, following the meal, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins, which is sealed in my blood poured out for the world. Take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. And so every time we gather at this table, every time we partake of this feast, 
we proclaim again our Lord's life, death, and resurrection until he comes again in glory. Remembering the risen Christ, we take from your creation this bread and wine as we live for the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer you now the sacrifice of our lives, for great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ, is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. ask our servers to come forward. Friends, our servers will bring to you each element in turn. I would invite you to take the element and to hold it in prayerful meditation until all have been served, that we might come to this table and to this feast together as one in the Spirit.
This is Christ's body, the bread of heaven. This is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. And having been fed in this meal, let us give thanks together. Gracious Lord, for these gifts, we give our utmost thanks for the joy of your calling and the spirit within us. We pray that such gifts would be used in your service, that nourished as we have been, we would nourish the world and proclaim your nearness your hope, and your goodness to all who are in need. Bless us in this, even as you have blessed us in this table. We pray now and always in your name. Amen. And in faithful response, let us once more join our voices and sing together hymn number 318. <laughs>
now in the joy that we have received, may you go out to proclaim the kingdom, to live in faithful integrity, to love God and others in the fullness of discipleship. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace and joy. Amen and amen. Amen.